Well, last Lord's Day, we looked at Romans chapter uh, 6, verses 15 through 18, under the title, Servants of Righteousness. We looked at three main points uh, in those uh, four verses. Uh, We considered a question of service in verse 15, a definition of service in verse 16, and a change of service in verses 17 and 18. This morning uh, we continue with this subject, servants of righteousness, in verses 19 to 23. Uh, The outline uh, will be based on the opening phrase of verse 19, I speak after the manner of men. We have four points, the manner of his speech, the reason of his speech, the exhortation of his speech, that's all in verse 19, and then in verses 20 to 23, the arguments uh, of uh, his speech. Let's read those words together. Romans chapter 6, verses 19 to 23. (coughs) Speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we come to the end of this uh, chapter, God willing, uh, this morning. Let us just go straight in uh, to our outline. First of all, the manner of his speech. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men. Calvin says, he says that he speaks after the manner of men, not as to the substance, but as to the manner. In other words, he's speaking in a human way. Uh, putting across these terms simply. Calvin goes on to add, So Christ says in John 3.12 that he announced earthly things while he yet spake of heavenly mysteries, though not so magnificently as the dignity of the things required because he accommodated himself to the capacities of a people ignorant and simple. If you like, Uh, He is making things as simple as he can, so they will get the point. And then Calvin makes a very um, important point here. He says this, It is a sort of reticence or silence, a withholding of something when we wish more to be understood than what we express. Do you get what he said there? It's a very important application here for us. It is a sort of reticence or silence, a withholding of something when we wish more to be understood than what we express. People will not know what we think unless we say it. And sometimes we think, oh, well, they'll get the point. No, they won't get the point. (laughs) That's what Calvin's saying. People will never understand us any more than what we say. They can't get the gospel unless we give them the gospel. They won't get it naturally. That's what Calvin is saying here. And that's what Paul is doing. Paul is bringing things down to such basic, simple, human argument and human explanation. Why? Because he wants them to get the point. That's his motive. In other words, Romans could be much shorter, could be much briefer, But the reason why it's not is because Paul wanted the Romans to get it. He wanted them to understand the point. And again, as Calvin makes reference to John chapter 3, the encounter with the Lord and Nicodemus, the Lord speaks very plainly 
of these heavenly things. In human terms, why? So Nicodemus, a master or a teacher in Israel, will get the point. If we want people to know what we believe, we need to tell them. They will not understand these things unless they are explained to them. Sometimes we make too much out of just living the example. Yes, we need to live the example. But the example without the words, just like the words without the example, are not sufficient. They need both. They need the words of the gospel and the witness of the gospel. They need both to understand. That's the manner of his speech. Secondly, the reason of his speech. Again in verse 19. Because of the infirmity of your flesh. Robert Haldane notes, this does not refer to the feeble or infantile state of spiritual knowledge among the Romans, but is applicable to mankind in general. Men in all places and in all ages and in every period of their lives are weak through the flesh, both in spiritual discernment and in the practice of holiness. Every Monday and Thursday we learn that, don't we? At least (laughs) those two days. We see how infantile and how lacking in discernment people are in spiritual things. And we hear the same thing over and over again. It's almost like the the human um, uh, state is to have this wrong understanding of truth, which is, it's almost the same. You know, just live the good life, just do the best you can, and hopefully it'll work out well in the end. That's what everybody seems to think. That is the default position. You know, it's like in a, uh, I'm not very good with computers, but you know, it says go back to the original settings. <laughs> it's like uh, going back to the original settings, you know, and that's the default position that everyone goes back to. They lack discernment, they lack knowledge, they are ignorant of the truth of the gospel, and therefore they need to be taught. And the Romans needed this, but not just the Romans. I think. Uh, Haldane is actually correcting uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Stewart, uh, uh, another commentator on this, who applies this just to the Romans. And Haldane is saying, no, this applies to everybody. Everybody's weak. Everybody's infantile. Everybody lacks discernment. And everybody needs to be taught the word of God. Consider here how kind and patient God is with us. We are stupid, we are ignorant, and yet God takes care and time and effort to communicate. 1,500 years it took to write the scriptures. God is patient in teaching us. Paul's a little more to the point with the Corinthians. He's he's gentle with the Romans, but in 1 Corinthians 3, he's a little bit more... Uh, straightforward. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. And I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal. It's like you're still in the world. It's like your minds are still uh, on the, the things of the world. Even as unto babes in Christ. It's like you've just been born and you've not learned anything. You've not developed You've not grown. Uh, Some people use this term nowadays, babes in Christ, as a sort of a, almost like, you know, uh, a generous term or a positive term. Paul's using it as a very negative term. It's like you've just come out of the womb and, in other words, you should be here. You should have advanced. In fact, as he says, or as, sorry, well, Paul would agree that um, it's Paul says in Hebrews. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, but there you go. It's another another point for another day. Uh, But in in Hebrews, uh, he says, at the time you ought to be teachers, you need that someone, again, teach you the basic principles of Christ. It says back in Corinthians, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For where there's among you envying, strife, divisions, and so on, are ye not carnal and walk as men? This actually shows how much wisdom there's needed in teachers, doesn't it? Uh, the one 
fear that those of us who teach the word of God always have is, are we actually giving what needs to be given at the time? Paul has this knowledge of the, and, and these people who he'd not yet um, even met, he could say these things, and this proves Haldane's point, doesn't it? Paul hadn't met all these Romans, and yet he could say these things, the infirmity of your flesh, because he knew the human condition. He doesn't need to meet them to know this. This is true of us all. But then notice thirdly, the exhortation of his speech. Again, verse 19. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Calvin says, as ye were formerly ready with all your faculties. This is a tremendous quote. As you are ready with, with all your faculties to serve sin. It is hence sufficiently evident how wretchedly enslaved and bound did your depravity hold you to itself. Now then, ye ought to be equally prompt and ready to execute the commands of God. Let not your activity in doing good be now less than it was formerly in doing evil. Isn't that a really helpful comment? so often the case, isn't it, that our enthusiasm and energies in working righteousness is so less than it was to work sin when we were in the world. Barnes is really excellent on this. He says, it is well for Christians to be reminded of their former lives. To awaken repentance, to excite gratitude, to produce humility and a firmer purpose to live to the honour of God. We need to be reminded what we were. Not so that we might, in, in a morbid, morose way, live in it again. But so as Barnes tells us, to awaken repentance, excite gratitude, produce humility and a firmer purpose to live to the honour and glory of God. He goes on to say this. Let the surrender of your members to holiness. Be as sincere. And as unqualified. As the surrender was to sin. This is all that is required of Christians. Before conversion. They were wholly given to sin. After conversion. They should be wholly given to God. If all Christians would, would employ the same energies in advancing the kingdom of God that they have in promoting the kingdom of Satan, the church would rise with dignity and grandeur and every continent and island would soon feel the movement. What a statement. If we just live to God like we lived to sin, what an effect that would have. He goes on to say, No requirement is more reasonable than this. And it should be a source of lamentation and mourning with Christians that it is not so. That they have employed so mighty energies in the cause of Satan and do so little in the service of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said of the woman, but they who are forgiven much, love much. It's quite often those who have been so committed to the service of sin and Satan. That are the ones after conversion who give so much to the service of the kingdom of God. Notice the end of verse 19. Even so now yield your members. Servants to righteousness unto holiness. Bring them. Bring them as willing servants to righteousness unto holiness. What righteousness is being spoken of here? Commentators differ on this. Some say positional. In other words, the righteousness of Christ. Some say it's practical. It could refer to both. But John Owen of Trussington, not John Owen, 
um, the John Owen, although that, that's unfair really, isn't it, the John Owen of Thursingen? He's just as much the John Owen, but just to make the difference. Um, <laughs> uh, he says this, um, Then comes the word righteousness, which I am disposed to think is that which all along has been spoken of, the righteousness of faith. This is not innate or, or inward, but which comes from without and is apprehended by faith, by which sins are forgiven and God's favour obtained. And they who become the servants of this are to cultivate holiness both inward and outward. They ought to present all their members, that is, all their faculties, to the service of this master so that they may become holy in all manner of conversation. So his view is this, and I tend to agree with him. It's only when we yield ourselves to the um, positional righteousness that we have in Christ that we will live holy. In other words, Paul is not saying, you know, be holy unto holiness. It's not exactly the opposite as the previous clause, uh, iniquity unto iniquity. He's saying something different here. He's saying the way of holiness, the way to be holy is to realize what Christ has done and submit yourselves and yield yourself to his righteousness. That righteousness that's being given to you and only in this way will you become holy people. In the rest of the verses now he presents um, a number of arguments to support this exhortation. A number of motivations to get us to have this focus of holiness in the Christian life. Argument number one in verse uh, 20. And this is an argument from the past of their sin. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. This is an argument from the past. When ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Haldane says the apostle is not speaking of freedom from righteousness as an advantage, either real or supposed, nor could he thus speak of it. He is speaking of it as a fact. And from that fact he argues that as when they were the servants of sin, they were free from righteousness, yielding no obedience to it, and acting as if they had nothing to do with it, and had no relation to it. So now, as they are the servants of righteousness, they ought to hold themselves free from the slavery of sin. What Haldane is saying, just as we had no relation to righteousness when we were unsaved, now we should consider that we have no relation to sin as the saved people of God. The relationship to sin has been broken. We are no longer its slaves. We are no longer, not only its slaves, we are no longer related to sin. Sin has been totally set apart from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That is the mindset that Paul says we must have. We must have the view that sin is no longer part and parcel of what we are. We are now new creatures. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All the old things are gone and all has become new. That is the basis of a holy life. If we don't get hold of that, if we don't grasp that truth, we will never be holy people. The positional truth is the foundation for the practical life. That is what Paul is saying. Calvin says he calls those free from righteousness who are held by no bridle to obey righteousness. It's like they're, they're wild horses. There's no bridle of righteousness. They're, they're just free to do what they want. That's why the nonsense of free will. We might give the idea or we might release the argument Yes, you're free, but what, what are you free to do? The scripture says your, your will is free in this sense. You can do what you want, but all that you will want is sin all the time. 
You're just like that horse that unless the bridle is put on and unless the, the horse is held and tamed and trained, that horse will never do what its owner wants. This, Calvin says, is the liberty of the flesh which so frees us from obedience to God that it makes us slaves to the devil. So we think we're free, but we're not free. In fact, all the way through Romans, it teaches us we're either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. There's never the in-between. There's never neutrality. There's never an in-between state. So the people in the world who think that they're free, yes, they're free from God, uh, this book tells us, but they're not free from sin. Wretched then, and accursed is this liberty, Calvin says, which with unbridled or rather mad frenzy leads us exultingly to our destruction. I've never seen this, and I don't even know if this is um, absolutely true, that there's these creatures who follow each other and literally just walk off the edge of the cliff. I don't even know if it's true. It's not true, is it? Well, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> I just got the, the shake there from uh, uh, a reliable authority, something I learned as a child. You know, I'm glad I've been finally corrected on that. But that's exactly, we're like those lemmings, aren't we? That just walk off the cliff. We, as Calvin says, with unbridled or rather mad frenzy, leads us exultingly to our destruction. Argument number two. First one, verse 20, from the past of our sin. Now argument number two, from the profit of our sin. What fruit, what profit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is that there is no profit in sin. Now, here's an important correction. People often wrongly say that there's no real pleasure in sin. That's nonsense. And that's not Paul's argument here. Paul is not arguing that there's no pleasure in sin. What he's saying is there's no profit in sin. Haldane puts it really well. Many interpret this verse as if the apostle denied that they had any pleasure in their sins at the time of committing them. This the apostle could not do, for it is a fact that men have pleasure in sin. They wouldn't do it if it wasn't pleasurable. To say that sinful pleasures is no pleasure, but is imaginary, is to abuse terms. All pleasure is a matter of feeling. And a man is no less happy than he feels himself to be if he imagines that he enjoys pleasure, he actually enjoys pleasure makes sense but what advantage is there in such pleasure is the question this is the question which the apostle asks yes sin is pleasurable but what profit is there in sin what is the end result what is the consequence and this is the argument he's using now the past verse 20 now the prophet what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed. Notice the past, present and future emphasis in this verse. What fruit had ye in those things? Past. Whereof ye are now ashamed. Present. For the end of those things is death future. So when we look at sin from past, present and future, there is no profit in sin. No profit in the past, no profit in the present, and no profit in the future. Sin pays no wages except what verse 23 describes. That's the only wages that sin pays. And as this verse even says, for the end of those things is death. On the second clause of those things ye are now ashamed, Calvin notes, he intimates that we are possessed with extreme blind love for ourselves when we are involved in the darkness of our sins and think not that there is so much filth in us. 
People don't like to be told this. We, we don't even like to think it, do we? We don't like to think about our sin. We are always tempted to think we're slightly better than we are. Look at chapter 1, verse 32 of, of, of Romans. This really shows the depravity of the heart. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Watson in his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, and I've quoted this recently, he'll do so again. It is worse to love sin than to commit it. And one of the attributes of our depravity is that we love sin. And not only according to Romans 1.32, not only do we love our own sin, but we take pleasure in those who commit it. There's a sense in which, isn't there, that as we look to the world and we see the way society is going, there's a sense in which, yes, we are to protest. Yes, we are to proclaim God's word. Yes, we are to stand against abortion. Yes, we are to stand against sodomy. Yes, we are to stand against all these things. But let us remind ourselves that it's God's purpose and plan to allow man to go to, his, uh, to a place where he, he sees how bad he is. So that he might cry out for repentance. Yes, all these things are awful. But even in this, God's plan of salvation is achieved. God's purpose. You see, we don't just want the world, world uh, and this society and this nation to, to live better lives. Yes, we want that. But more than that, we want this nation to be saved. So... Rather that the nation goes to the extremities of, of its debauchery so that it might be saved. Rather than live an appearance of godliness but deny the power thereof. We shocked somebody on the open air recently. When we said a certain man who committed terrible crimes... We have reason to believe he was con on death row in America. We have reason to believe he was converted. And we shocked him and we said this. It's quite possible his victims are in hell and he is in heaven. That's a shocking thought, isn't it? It's quite possible everyone he murdered is in hell and he himself is in heaven. And, 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 the, and the, the person to whom we were speaking was understandably shocked at that. But that is what the scripture tells us is true. The, the thief on the cross beside Christ more than likely was also a murderer. For in, in that time, the punishment for theft was the same as the punishment for murder. So most thieves actually killed their victims so that he wouldn't be caught. Because if they were caught, they would be crucified anyway. So there was one who was a thief, yes, but more than likely a murderer. And Christ said to him, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And maybe if he was a murderer, maybe his victim at that moment was in hell. That's shocking. It is shocking. But that's something to take on board in our understanding of what salvation is. Salvation is not an improvement of our lifestyle. It is a, it is a clinging on to Jesus Christ. Because we realize how desperately wicked we are. Argument number three. From the present. The past. Verse 20. The prophet. Verse 21. And now the present. Verse 23. Verse 22. Sorry. But now. Being made free from sin. And become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end everlasting life. Here we have one of the great but nows of scripture. But now being made free 
from sin. I love the but nows, do you? I love when the scripture says but now. What a contrast. What a, what a difference that God has made. This is what we were. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to Satan. We were on our way to destruction. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were facing an eternal hell. But now being made free from sin. What a wonderful contrast. Notice here in this verse we have, first of all, what we have been made free from sin. What we have become servants to God. What we have been given fruit unto holiness. And what we have been promised everlasting life. Calvin says, sin in this life brings the torments of an accusing conscience. We all know what that means. Even the unsaved know what that means. The torments of an accusing conscience. And in the next eternal death, we now gather the fruit, of, the fruit of righteousness, even holiness. We hope in future to gain eternal life. These things, unless we are beyond measure stupid, I love the way Calvin talks sometimes, <laughs> ought to generate in our minds a hatred and horror of sin and also a love and desire for righteousness. It is stupid, isn't it? When we read what Paul says here in, in, in Romans, how foolish it is not to flee from the slavery of sin and run into the arms of willing servitude to Christ and to righteousness. How foolish to leave this place this morning and not have settled this issue. Of where I stand in relationship to God and his truth. In relationship to the cross. How foolish for the other thief on the other side of the cross. To go to hell when he died with Christ in a physical sense. But didn't die with Christ in a spiritual sense. One died with Christ only physically. The other died with Christ spiritually. And so raised again. Argument number four. Our last argument, verse 23. Past, prophet, present. I don't like being smart in sermons, but now a different kind of present. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The present of verse 22 is time. The present of verse 23 is that gift of God, which is eternal life. Notice, first of all, the wages. Listen to what Barnes says here. It's wonderful. The word translated here, wages, properly denotes what is purchased to be eaten with bread or fish or vegetables, etc. And thence it may... It means the pay of the Roman soldier. Because formerly it was the custom to pay the soldier in these things. It means hence what a man earns or deserves. What is his proper pay? Or what he merits as applied to sin? It means that death is what sin deserves. What will be its proper reward? Haldane describes these words in vivid terms. Or these wages in vivid terms. Listen to this. This punishment. This punishment will be adapted to both the component to both the component parts of a man's nature. To the soul as well as to the body. It will connect all the ideas of the past, the present, and the future. As to the past, it will bring to the recollection of the wicked the sins they committed, the good they abused, and the false pleasures by which they were deluded. As to the present, their misery will be aggravated by their knowledge of the glory of the righteous, from which they themselves are forever separated and by the direful company of the devil and his angels, to the endurance of whose cruel slavery they are forever doomed. 
as to the future. The horrors of their irreversible condition will be rendered more insupportable by the overwhelming conviction of its eternity. To the whole must be added that rage against God, whom they will hate as their enemy without any abatement or diminution. Listen, if you're a hater of God, you need to change. Because that hatred which is suppressed at the moment by the grace of God, by the common grace of God, one day, if you're not saved in hell, that hatred will consume your soul for all eternity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is not true. Um, this is a terrible thing to say, but if this is true, we need to take this to our hearts this morning. Later on, he says, the punishment then of the wicked will be eternal. According to the figures employed, as well as to the express declarations of Scripture, sin being committed against the infinity of God. Just listen to what he says here. Sin being committed against the infinity of God merits an infinite punishment. In the natural order of justice, this punishment ought to be, in, ought to be infinitely great. But as that is impossible, since the creature is incapable of suffering pain in an infinite degree, infinity in greatness is compensated by infinity in duration. The punishment then is finite in itself. And on this account it is capable of being inflicted in a greater or less degree. But as it is eternal, it bears the same proportion to the greatness of him who is offended. Notice lastly, the gift that we in no way deserve or have earned but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord again we have another wonderful but of scripture what we deserve the wages of sin the wages is our just desert it's what we're owed it's our payment the gift we do not deserve the gift of God, unmerited. Something we not only haven't worked for, but we cannot work for. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is it from? God. Who is it true? Christ. One last quote, and then we finish. Aldean says, These blessings will not be measured in the proportion of the creatures who receive them. In other words, not according to us, but of God who confers them. And of the dignity of the person of Jesus Christ and of his merit, of his person. For they shall obtain that felicity only in virtue of the communion which they have with him, of his merit. For he has purchased it with the price of his blood. May God bless his word to our souls this day. Let us pray. O oh Lord, help us. Help us to be convinced by thy holy word of our need for Jesus Christ. Of our need for a righteousness that is not our own. For our need of a holiness that we cannot perform. O oh Lord, grant to us. Grant to us, Lord, this day. According to thy glorious mercy 
that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless our souls as we partake of the Lord's table in his precious name. Amen.